Hi, good afternoon. How are you doing? Fine. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the first time I'm going to do this talk, and so I'm uh, a little bit nervous, but I think we'll be fine. So the talk is on isolating GPU access in its own process, which is a very niche topic. Uh, but it might be interesting for more projects outside of Chromium. I know of several other projects that have this type of problem. So, first, who am I? My name is, my name is Patricia Oss. I am a C++ developer. I've been a C++ developer for about 13 years. I currently work in Vivaldi. We make a browser. I brought stuff. So, after the talk, please take. Um, before that, I worked in Cisco, where I made telepresence systems, and uh, I was a short time a consultant. And before that, I made another browser called Opera. Anybody use Opera? Thank you. I worked on the original Opera browser, not the new Opera browser. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that's me. That's my Twitter handle. I have it practically on every slide, so you don't have to take note. So. What is it like building a browser? Uh, I, I started now in, in Vivaldi, which is Chromium based, and we're going to talk a little bit about Chromium. But previously in Opera, I worked on a, a different uh, source, which is a big difference. Like Chromium, like in, those of you who have had experience with, uh, with Android, with the entire Android, Chromium is very similar in pulling in all sorts of open source projects. So the actual source is massive. Uh, a debug build on Linux uh, is close to 100 gig. One debug build. So it's huge. Um, but we are going to look at a little tiny aspect throughout. But building a browser is fun and you guys should do it. Okay, so I'm, I'm, this talk is a bit Linux focused. I'm a bit Linux focused. Um, so. If you have Windows questions or Mac questions, I'm probably not the, question, the person to ask. Okay, so first of all, what is Chromium? And to say that, I, there is a little bit of a browser trivia here. So, um, I, I noticed there were like people from the, from the KDE project. Are there any KDE people here now? Yeah, there you go. Because that is the source <laughs> of all of these browsers. Uh, I, I worked in Opera when Apple uh, made Safari and they chose KHTML and that, that engine because they said the code was better, easier to read, they said, than the alternative. So I'm not going to name names, but that's what they said. So, uh, But this was quite of a tense time at the time because, we'll try that. Uh, because this was an open source project and it was practically forked into, hidden inside of Apple. And Apple said that they would release it, but it was all, it was a quite a tense period. But in the end, uh, Apple did publish the code, but they published the code by dropping it uh, once a night without any really source um, versioning between. And that was a problem later when Google came and said, oh, we want to make a browser too. Because one of the things that you'll see here, and one of the things that most people don't know, is that nobody makes a browser from scratch. Nobody has made a browser from scratch since the 90s. <laughs> there are four browser families. Uh, one of them has been discontinued, and that was the Opera as a browser family. Uh, so there are three browser families in the world. Um, so choosing a browser is basically picking one, but they all come from very few sources. And so this is the source of many browsers, and it came from KDE, so kudos to KDE for that. Um, but anyway, so, so when uh, Chrome decided, no, when Google decided to make Chrome, they had a problem because they got the source code once a night, and they uh, had no control over the quality of it. And they had lots of problems with the crashing all the time. And they made a framework around WebKit, um, which basically put WebKit in its own process, and then made the browser another process, and then composed all of this stuff together um, to make the final window. 
And the, the feature of this and how they marketed it when they started making Chrome was that, um, you know, you could have a tab and it can crash and it doesn't crash the whole browser. This is, this is a problem they had because WebKit was crashing, tabs were crashing. Anyway, so moving on later on, uh, Opera decided not to have their own engine anymore and uh, went over to use uh, the Blink fork of WebKit and that's another story. Anyway, so there are lots of browsers based on this Blink fork, uh, among them uh, Chrome and Brave and Vivaldi and uh, the new Opera. Okay, so the process architecture inside of a Chromium browser on Linux looks something like this. So there are several processes, and you'll see that if you do PS, you'll see many different kinds of processes. Um, coming from like an Android or a slash Linux type background, um, this is sort of Linuxy. So if you look at the left side, you have the Saigot init. That's my name. I made it up, but. It's basically like an init process, and it just takes care of, of reaping child processes and just sits there spinning. You have the Saiga process, it's similar to uh, the Saiga concept in Android, where it basically forks off new processes. And these processes end up being these vendor processes that you see at the bottom, and a vendor process is roughly corresponds to one tab. So you will have you will, in your browser, you will have one browser process, and then you might have one render process per tab. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you will see that the GPU access is split into two processes. I'm not going to talk about the GPU broker much. But, so all of the GPU access is done from one process. And the render processes are completely sandbox, so they, they can't touch the GPU. They're, they don't even have access to the file system. I have a whole talk on sandboxing in Chromium, which is on YouTube. <laughs> anyway, so this is like the general world we're living in. Uh, and of course, when you end up in this kind of world, you need some kind of composition. You need some way to compose the final browser window, because now you have all sorts of processes producing these images, and in the end it has to be composed into one. Um, so why would you do this? Like, why would you have a separate GPU process in your project? And in Chromium, why would why would you do GPU composition in a separate process? Why not just do it in the browser process because it's there already? And actually, it's it's done. They have a GPU thread on Android, but I'm not going to talk about that because I'm desktop focused. Okay, so generally you will, you will hear people talk about three reasons, actually a fourth as well, but we'll get to it in the end. So the first one is security. And the issue around security is, of course, that you want to, to, uh, to have a really uh, strict sandboxing of the render process. And uh, because, well, okay, we'll get back to that. I'll do this first, because this is an interesting example, actually. Uh, you've seen several uh, vulnerabilities where you've had things like texture memory being leaked in different ways. Uh, where it hasn't been properly zeroed out before given it to other processes or given it to the browser or given it from one tab to another tab. Um, and you get junk or junk. It could be interesting junk uh, given to other things. Um, so. So one of the things that, that uh, Google wanted to do when they made this design is to, to enforce a, a stricter and more uniform uh, contract with the render process. Uh, but at the same time you have robustness. And like I said before, we had the, they had already put the render in its own process and uh, to, to make sure that the browser didn't crash, if there is something inside of the render, it crashed. Uh, but you also have had issues in many projects uh, of, of bugs in graphics drivers and, and those making um, your application crash. Or some kind of, we, like inside of the render you have a WebGL stuff that you basically download, 
code from the internet and execute on the user's machine. That's what we do. Like, uh, like I said at a security conference, remote execution is our business model. We do that. We download random code from the internet and execute it on your machine. That's kind of what a browser is. <laughs> And so you wouldn't want something to crash the whole browser. So you can put in a layer here of, of workarounds. Workarounds for driver bugs, workarounds for, uh, for features, workarounds for lack of features, all sorts of things. And also a very cool thing that you can do in a Chromium based browser is that you can actually crash the GPU process and not bring down the browser. And you might have seen this in, in, uh, on your machines in any kind of Chromium based browser. If the GPU process crashes, your window goes black. And then it goes like a couple of seconds and it comes back. That's magic. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Okay, another thing that is, um, it could be very interesting in, in certain situations is dependency separation. Now, like I said before, you, uh, in a Chromium-based browser, you're trying to minimize the render sandbox massively, as much as you can. Uh, and that results in a very strange kind of process, which is, it uses um, namespaces, it uses seccomp, uh, it uses uh, Shiru to, to, uh, to uh, basically cut off this process from the file system. A render process is a very strange animal in your machine. And back again, you can watch my other talk about that. Um, but one of the things that I find specifically interesting um, is the fact that they can have different dependencies. Now, of course, you have different dependencies already because you're not loading uh, GL libraries into your render because that's kind of the point here. Uh, but you can also have other kinds of dependencies, like different versions of different libraries that you can have in these two different processes. And it, this is in a general design, if you want to do this. And, you know, I, I, I had the pleasure of reading uh, lots of Lib Hyperset uh, question mark, right? <laughs> and in Lib Hyperset, uh, that is also a problem that is trying to be solved, the fact that you have um, Bionic over here, and you have glibc over there, and how are these things going to coexist? And and maybe you could have had some way of doing this over IPC. I'm not sure if it would work, and that's kind of what this talk is about. One thing that they bring up a lot when you read about it on the interweb <laughs> is that they say, "Oh, but it's very performance is very good." And the funny thing is, because whenever you propose this idea, most people go like, yeah, but what about performance? If you have all your, all your GPU access in one process, you basically have to serialize things, right, over IPC to this one process. And people are worried about the performance, whereas the Google people think that performance is better. And the reason why they think that it's better is because everything is asynchronous, so they just fire something off to the GPU process and don't think about it. And since it's a whole different uh, process, um, scheduling on the machine might be better. I don't know. I don't know if it's better. They claim it is. Okay, but before we, we look at Chromium, I just... This is, this is a generic wisdom. We can solve any problem by introducing an extra level of indirection, except the problem of too, level, too many levels of indirection. This is called the fundamental theorem of software engineering. Um, and if you try to look in the Google code or in the Chromium source code for a long time, this will feel like you need it in poster size. It is ridiculously many layers of indirection and indirection everywhere. And it can be very difficult to navigate. And so this talk is more or less pointing you to the places that might be interesting if this is the kind of problem that you'd like to solve. Okay, so first we're going to look at the communication architecture. And uh, that is the IPC that's involved uh, and the concept of something they call a command and the synchronization. Okay, so remember this is the, this is the process architecture. So this is like 
parent-child relationships between these things. But in addition to the process architecture and the relationship with um, parent-child, you have a massive amount of IPC channels everywhere. And in this case, I'm just going to be looking at a simple set of IPC channels, and those are the ones that go in from the render of the browser to the GPU process. In addition to the IPC itself, you will have shared memory. There's tons of stuff that are allocated in shared memory. They use shared memory extensively in a Chromium project. Uh, but in this case, we're going to be looking at two things, something they call command buffer and uh, GPU memory buffers. Okay, so the high-level design of this thing is the idea of a client-server architecture. So the GPU process is the server, and then you have clients which are renderers or the browser process. On the client side, it emulates OpenGL ES2. So that means no matter if you're on desktop or if you're on, on, uh, on an embedded device or if you're on mobile or whatever, on the client side, it emulates OpenGL ES2. So the actual implementation is platform specific and it depends, you know, some place it will be regular open desktop OpenGL. Um, the composition is done, the final composition, this is if you are doing hardware composition, which my entire talk will assume. Um, then uh, the, the composition, the final composition is done inside of the GPU process. But it is controlled outside. So you have the browser is controlling the massive amount of views and everything. So you have like the tabs and you have all of these things. So it's a high level thing. And then you have the render process itself is doing the, the controlling the composition of the web page. So implementation design, <laughs> like moving down levels here. Okay, so you, you have this emulation of OpenGL ES2, but uh, you are now in a different process. So these things are serialized into something they call a command. And these commands are placed in a, a, a place of shared memory, which is, is kind of like a ring buffer. Uh, and they call this a command buffer. So basically you put commands in a command buffer in shared memory. And all of the clients will have this now to show a little picture. And then the GPU will deserialize these commands, do validation, maybe workarounds, maybe compensate, whatever they want to do. And then finally do the actual call to the platform's the graphic system. Yeah, so this is basically the, the high-level architecture. You have the, you have, you write a command as a client to this command buffer, then you do signaling over IBC to say that you're done in some way, to so say, okay, I'm at this right position here. And asynchronously then, the, the GPU process uh, will be able to read commands up to your position. And at the same time, you could be writing past that position at a later point, you will say, I'm at this put position. And so basically that's how it goes. On the server side, you have the GPU process, and it will read these commands uh, from shared memory and do all sorts of things, you know. But you will have many clients, so there has to be some kind of, kind of scheduling between this. And so, in addition to this, you might want to do some, some, some kind of synchronization because you have many different um, channels of communication, and we'll look at that in a little bit. And they have different kinds of synchronization depending. So this is my most complicated diagram. <laughs> Um, but it's kind of important, so I'll, I'll go through it a little bit. Okay, so you have three concepts here. You have an IPC channel, which should be like, like well-known. But then you have something that uh, they call a command stream. And inside of a command stream, they have these command buffers. Now, right now, I'm, this, is, this is a conceptual drawing, right? Because these command buffers are actually in shared memory and, you know, they're in ring buffer and quite boring in real life. But, but this is the, the design. So as a, a client, you will push a command on this command buffer. And a command buffer could be in, you could have, in the top one, you have one IPC channel that has one command stream which has one command buffer. 
But you can have several command buffers inside of one command stream, or you can have several command streams inside of one IPC channel. And depending on where you are and what is your scenario, you have different kinds of synchronization. So in the middle there is the easiest one. Uh, if you have two uh, command, well, first of all, the easiest is if you only have one command buffer. There's no need for synchronization. They will be read and executed sequentially, and so this is, there's no need for synchronization. But if you have two command, uh, command buffers inside of one command stream, which is the middle example, then they have something they call an ordering barrier. So basically everything before has to be processed before you can kind of pass the ordering barrier. Um, if you have the bottom one, so if you have two uh, command streams that each have a command buffer, then if you want some kind of synchronization between these, you use something called an unverified sync token. It's, uh, the, the concept of rats sort of fences. So what you will have is on the, the bottom uh, command buffer, you, are, you have put in a wait token, so you want to wait for this other unverified sync token, which basically means that the two commands in front of the sync token have to be processed before the unverified sync token is processed, and when it is processed, it is signaled, and then unblocking the bottom string. And the last one is a verified sync token, which works across IPC channels. And uh, we won't look very much at them, but you'll see them um, a little bit. Okay, so the sync token, this is uh, the concept of a sync token. So it inserts a synchronization fence inside of the command stream. And it, uh, how it is handled it depends on support on the platform, uh, but it is pretty high level concept inside of a Chromium, which means you can have different kinds of implementations. Um, it can also be attached to a resource, and that's what we're going to see. That you do uh, a bunch of GL commands, um, to establish some kind of texture. And then you insert, uh, insert uh, um, uh, a sync token in the command stream. Later on, other things that need this texture can wait on your sync token to make sure that it has been created, it is all of these things have already been done by the time you move on. And to, to hold the sync token and to connect it to a uh, texture target, you have something called uh, a mailbox holder, which you can pass around. Okay, so the, the example that I'm going to show is, is uh, a video frame that has been software decoded. So we're going to use that to explore how composition works. Now, if you have software composition, which Chromium supports, and that was the original uh, design, uh, then it was done in the browser process. Um, in most modern, on most modern computers, you will have a hardware GPU composition, but it depends on your uh, GPU, and you will have there's um, there's lots of workarounds for different kinds of bugs in GPUs. But the last resort is something they call uh, GPU blacklisting. So if they think your GPU is not possible to work with. Chromium will blacklist your GPU, and then all of your, all, everything will be software-based. Which means that for, uh, for, um, for some machines, uh, the, the, the performance will be dramatically different, because the GPU is not possible to use. Yeah. Okay, so, insert some hand wiping. <laughs> the full architecture of composition inside of Chromium is massive and it spans uh, all over the source code. Uh, so it is, it is very difficult to, to, to get an idea on how it is. And how my mind is, it's much easier to see one path and then you kind of understand how it all gets put together. So we're going to follow one path and we're, what we are going to do is try to see how a software decoded video frame ends up inside a mobile page. So, How video is decoded inside of Chromium is, a, is another thing, and I'm just going to kind of skip lightly over that, but 
uh, if you have a software decoder frame, at some point it will be in memory, either in shared memory or in, in uh, normal memory, uh, inside of the render process. And uh, the GPU composition is done in the GPU process, so you want to upload this software buffer, a decoded video frame, which is basically a chunk of memory, and you want to upload it to the GPU as a texture, so you can compose it as a texture. And this is, I, I, I realized at a little bit uh, going into this, is that I ended up writing, drawing lots of boxes and arrows. And then, uh, this is a quote from me, because I can quote myself, because I'm here. At, at a high enough level of abstraction, everything looks the same. Law of PowerPoint architecture. <laughs> Anybody who's been in like an architecture meeting, in the end you just kind of draw like, okay, so we have this box over here and there's an arrow to this other box, and basically that's the architecture of anything. <laughs> but there's going to be boxes, and there's going to be arrows. Okay, so first, just a very rough idea of how software decoding on video works, is basically you can get some internet stuff, coming into the browser process, and this is an interesting part of, of uh, Chromium architecture, is that network access in the browser is centralized inside of the browser process. So the, the renderers, this is, this is a, a browser, right? What you do is like you download stuff from the internet and you display it, but the renderers cannot access the network. So all of the network traffic goes through the browser process. Anyway, it's a, another kind of interesting tidbit. So anyway, so the network uh, uh, traffic is then piped um, over IPC again to the render process. And uh, that's like a nice hand wavy kind of box that says decoder. So something magic happens and uh, this is decoded. Now this decoder can sometimes be uh, inside of the GPU process, sometimes you do hardware decoding, it decodes directly into a texture, we're not going to look at that. Uh, in Vivaldi we also do software decoding inside of the D GPU process, even though it doesn't use the GPU because it has a looser sandbox. Uh, so, so, and then we don't want to loosen the render sandbox. Anyway, so the, so the, you have this decoder, magic decoder, gets this video stream thing, and it produces a video frame. Now, the, the actual class is called video frame. Uh, but in this case, it has like many instantiations, and we'll look at two, but this is the, the basic one for when you've had uh, a decoded frame, a uh, software decoded frame on Linux on my machine. So you have a, a Y plane, a U plane, and a V plane, and it's in this memory buffer, uh, which is. Uh, could be in the memory of the render, or it could be in shared memory, wherever. But from the point of view of the render, it assumes it's in the re in the regular memory. So now we need to texturize this, push it to the GPU somehow. Now we're inside of the render process; we have no contact with the GPU. Uh, so how how is this done? Now, if you go digging inside of the Chromium source code, you'll see that there are different ways that they uh, upload textures. And there's lots of if devs and checks. But this is like the general plan. So in Mac, you use this um, GL texture rectangle ARB. On Android and Linux, you use GL texture external OES. And generally, everywhere else or whenever the above doesn't work, you do use GL texture 2D. But we're going to be looking at Linux. So OES EGL Image External is an extension to uh, OpenGL ES2 uh, where um, you can create EGL images and then you can, um, you can use those to create a texture. In our case, it's going to use uh, two, one for the Y plane and one for, the, uh, and one for both the U and the B plane. This is kind of, just skip the parts where I say plane if you don't care about video. But I'm going to be drawing them all the time, so just pretend. 
Um, okay, how? Okay, for for people who are not like video uh, nerds, the wide plane. This is a is a type of of um, sort of like a compression of a of a video frame, where the wide plane has uh, luminance, so you can have uh, uh, because that's very visible to the human eye, how bright or dark something is. And the UV plane has the color, but they have uh, less space in memory. Anyway, so in this case, we, we started off with what we have on the left, right? So we have this video frame thing, and then we have a memory buffer, and it has the YU and the V plane. That's great. But we need to put it on the GPU. So what happens is that we create another video frame object, and then we construct a thing for it. So it has. So we do. Co we copy all of this stuff into shared memory, uh, into something that it calls a GPU memory buffer, where we put the U and the V plane together and the Y plane along, and we attach this to the video frame. But at the same time, we also use uh, these commands that we are serializing over this pipe uh, to say that we want to copy them uh, in on the GPU. So I have, I have in my appendix thing, I have another much more complicated diagram of this. So we'll see if we get to it. Um, anyway, but the most important thing is here is that after you have done all of your GL commands, uh, you generate the sync token. So that means that you have all of these commands to bind this texture and blah, 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 and then you generate an unverified sync token. So that means that all of the things before has to be processed before the sync token is, is signaled. And so anything that uses this texture later on can wait on the sync token to make sure that all of this has been done. And uh, yeah, so the, the, they all have the exact same sync token. So whenever I have like a show, in all of my slides I show the sync token, it is the same one. Like, the actual same one, all the time, uh, which is passed around. And this is put inside of this object called the mailbox holder, and the mailbox holder also has another kind of thing which is called the mailbox. And a mailbox just has a unique name. And the unique name is kind of connected to, to, uh, to this image on the, in the GPU process. Okay, so, now we want to, uh, so we have this like uh, video frame which has these mailboxes and, and sync token and so on. Uh, but then they, again, this is like levels of indirection, right? So this thing is again moved into something they call a transferable resource. And it takes a hold of the sync token and the mailboxes and everything. And from now on, we don't care about the video frame anymore. Okay, so then we get to, uh, to the point where we want to render this. And like I said, there's like layers of indirection. In this case, we are looking at transferable resources. And these transferable resources are put into uh, a storage, saying these are the ones resources we're using for the current paint. And uh, they're registered and they get IDs. In this case, it's ID 0 and ID 1. And this is put in something called a layer tree resource provider. So if you have a tab and you have many videos, then you might have many or many other kinds of resources in that web page. They will all be put into this layer tree resource provider. And when uh, the actual um, rendering happens, that's where it's going to fetch them from. So what we're going to do here is we're, it will create what is called a YUV video draw quad and attach it to something it calls a render pass. And a render pass just has lots of these quads, basically squares that know how to paint themselves somehow. And this is the last one. Basically, yeah, that's what it does. So you have this UIV video drop quad, it has these resources attached, it has a clip region, and here is where the GL program is. So it basically, picks off all sorts of attributes to put in uh, your um, GL program, which is, uh, you can see all of this in uh, the class called GL Renderer, in the function called draw you, YUV Video Quad. 
and um, basically it, uh, it uses all sorts of information and the references to the texture IDs and it draws. Now, we are still inside of the rendering process and this is using OpenGL ES2 commands from the rendering process. So you, you haven't really, the code you don't really see um, on the client side, you don't really see uh, the GPU at all, you kind of pretend you have a local local interface. And that sounds all well and good because now it seems like, okay, I can abstract this away and everything's good or whatever, but they added lots of extensions, right? Because some of this is not supported. So they have a whole bunch of GLES2 extensions. Um, but these are like some that, that are used in this specific example. And where for the image, uh, they have um, for, for the actual copying of the data over and, and to the EGL images that makes it up the texture later and so on. That's the Chromium image extension. And for the mailbox, it has a separate extension. And for the sync token, it has also another extension. And there are many extensions. And they generally look like that. So you have a Chromium underscore. So can I use? Because that's kind of like the idea. It's like if you want to have this kind of architecture, is this something that you can just grab and use in your project? No. <laughs> Not the way it is, at least. Um, because there are three kinds of APIs that are in use from the render side. You have like a standard OpenGL ES2, and that's fine. If you use that, you can just kind of pretend. Uh, but you also have these Chromium APIs, which are extensions. But, and, and you have also just a plain Chromium API. This is not made to be generic. It's made to fix a specific architectural thing inside of Chromium. And then we have another nice quote. I generally don't do quotes, but I really felt quotey in this presentation. And that's uh, from Joe. Um, the, the famous Joe Long software blog from 2002. All non-trivial abstractions to some degree are leaky. Now we like to pretend that this is not true and we keep on programming like it's not true, but it is true that when you try to make something that is sufficiently complicated, then some of the restrictions in the implementation will leak through your interface. That's, I'm landing on a good thing. Because if it's not, then you have to compensate. You have to make workarounds. And generally, those workarounds are very expensive. There's a reason why you're pushing your complications all the way to your interface. If you didn't, you would probably make something that was very inefficient. So, not exactly cut and paste. But it's interesting. And it is something that it runs on your machine. So you know, you know it works. You know it's fairly efficient because it does work. And so the question is, is more for your own project is, does it solve a problem for you? Is it sufficiently important? Because this is a non-trivial amount of code and it's a non-trivial amount of system. So can I use? I Maybe, maybe. It, some people ask me uh, about operating systems that do massive amounts of sandboxing of their processes and they can't do any GL stuff. Maybe you would want to introduce some kind of GL service in that kind of operating system. And in that case, it's like it's for the whole operating system. It's not just for one application. And so you might actually think that, this, that the amount of complexity and the amount of work might be worth it. Um, so uh, I have I have since I have a little bit of time I have some extra slides so we'll skip through that and I'll uh, I'll come back to this part okay so these are not these are like random thoughts okay so this is not very interesting but I thought it was kind of interesting is the actual um, copying into shared memory of these. Uh, of these buffers. 
where they use lib UI based, uh, y -U -V, sorry, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. Also the fact that there's copying. And this is the more complicated view of what we saw before. And here you actually see the GL commands. Um, so, so you had this video frame before, it had these frame resources. In our case there are two, not three, but you can have up to three. And the mailbox holders up there that hold uh, uh, the references to the texture target, texture ID thing. So you have the GPU, uh, so when you, the first call that you get is the bind texture. So you have the texture target and you have this texture ID, which is connected to your plain resource. And uh, then you create, you, you use this uh, image, the Chromium image extension and call this function called create image chromium which uh, binds your memory buffer to your image and then afterwards you do the bind text image to the chromium now like like i said this is like this is not generic right this is this is very specific to chromium and you bind that image to a texture target And this code is in this uh, class up there. And this is, this is another thing that they love inside of Chromium. They love really, really long class names. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, if it could be a sentence, please. Okay, so this is a GPU memory buffer video frame pool. And this is what it does. Okay, so, so the Chromium image extension, it has, uh, it has these functions. And, and this is how this egl image versus texture uploading thing uses these um, so it's not like like, it, like let's say that you have a gl application or or um open gl es2 application and you just kind of want to just pop it on top of this thing and it's supposed to be all transparent and just work and stuff that's don't expect that there is like serious leakage here this is this is not standard. And this, oh, remember I talked about layers of abstraction. I moved this, I had this slide and you can see it's not finished because I don't have like fancy colors. <laughs> but you have to, it's like, I, I find this like so funny. Okay, so, uh, okay, I don't know which end you want to start in, but you basically have, you have the decoders down there, right? So that's where the video frame is coming from. But basically, it's pushed into this uh, rend video render info, which is in the middle all the way to the right. When it gets a frame, it kind of pushes it over to what is called the video frame compositor. Now, the video frame compositor implements video render sync, and that's how it gets this callback. Uh, but it is a video frame provider, which also has, of course, a client interface, which the video frame provider client info implements. <laughs> See, I told you there's like this the code is not really easy to read. And these things are of course not even co-located in the code, so it's absolutely you kind of have to just like grab to find things. Um, and of course that you have for each video frame on the web page, you will have a video frame provider client info. Yeah. That's great. Anyway, so this one has something called an active video layer, and that's active video layer is where you kind of you get a paint, and this is how the logic of how you got to do this paint happens, and it uses this video resource updater, which is the one that actually uh, populates the render paths and so on. And anyway, and this is just like just a little bit of things that are connected to this specific thing, which is basically the bottom part here. You have decoders, it puts out a video frame, it gets into this very small thing, which is an active video layer, which knows how to paint itself, and it makes this GL program and paints it. And you would think this would be simple, but there are like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 classes. <laughs> So, and, and this is just a tiny bit. So navigating the Chromium source code is not for the faint of heart. But if you want to, I would read these. So I told you about the GPU memory video, no, buffer video frame pool. <laughs> and then you have the video resource updater. Um, then you have the GL render. 
and then you have a uh, program binding.cc. So if I was going to read four classes to understand how this thing works, or four files, then I would read those. And nah, we're gonna skip that. But there's a, an interesting. I'm not. I'm not gonna talk about it much. But uh, like what you saw is that you have resource sharing across these command buffers. And to be able to do that, you have to uh, to create the context in a shared group to be able to share resources between them. And uh, this has uh, implications to things that you can use in the underlying APIs, like GeoFence. Um, okay, now we're gonna go back. There we go. Ah, no, there we go. Because that's my, uh, it's my pet um, cause. We've seen uh, in the last few years, we have made, uh, I, I come from a product background. I make products, I don't make services, and I, and I also spent five years working in the embedded uh, industry, and we make like physical products for people. And we've seen several cases of making products for people that don't work for people with dark skin, for uh, people with disabilities. And, and you have certain things that you've seen, like the fact that we actually managed to have a technology sector making products that didn't support Unicode for decades. That says something about us. Because the world is not 7-bit ASCII. So, what is important to me is, is people talk about being inclusive and diversity as something that is just a nice to have thing. But the thing is, what we're seeing is that we're producing products that don't work on people with dark skin. Snapchat released these like fancy filters that you can put like little wiggly things on your head. They were released to production and they didn't work on people with dark skin. How do you do that? How do you do that in 2016? That means you didn't have a single person in your office that walked into your office while you're testing this and playing around with this that said, oh, can I try to put a little wiggly thing on my head? Every single person throughout the entire pipeline were white. It's the only, only way you get to this point. You had as the, the iWatch, the first one, it couldn't measure the pulse of black people. How do you do that? You ship it to production, you can't do it because you can't test, you can't find the pulse of, uh, on someone who has dark skin. And we keep on doing this over and over again. We make things that are, are uh, anti-trans, we enforce people to specify their gender. What really, do you really need to know your user's gender? <laughs> we, 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 as a community that makes things, for everyone in the world. We need to have representation in our teams for everyone in the world. And, you know, people talk about uh, diversity as being like, we need more women. But the thing is, we don't only need more women. We need all, everybody. Like, just think about your own careers, your own teams. How many openly gay men have you worked with? This is something that doesn't show you, you know? You can't tell. How many gay men, white men in our industry are not open about their sexuality for fear of re repercussions? This, is, this isn't just about women. It's not just about people with dark skin. It's about everybody. We have to have room to be different. We have to have room for people to not be the same, because that is the feature. That is the feature. If you have a team where everyone, where you have representation of all sorts of people, and they feel safe, they feel safe to tell you who they are, then they will tell you when things you do don't work. When the interfaces that you make are really, really bad for right-to-left languages. If you have a person who has a background uh, that, that can read right-to-left, they'll tell you this will look really strange. And nobody will like this because the OK button is to the right and not to the left. And they'll tell you. And, and to do this, we, we have to have the people in the room. 
but we also have to make them feel safe. And that is a central point, because to make these products that don't work for large portions of the world's population, then either they weren't in the room, or they were too afraid to say something, or when they did say something, we didn't listen. So this is, this, is, this is to all of us. We all have biases, we all have things we need to work on. This is not like, oh, you have, no, no, we all have, I have lots of things I need to work on. What I'm saying is, as an industry, if we really want to service the entire world, then we have to work on making stuff that works for the entire world. And that is my last slide, except this one, because I have lots of stuff. <laughs> so before you clap, it's like, before you leave, you can have questions and everything, but before you leave, please take stuff. I work for a browser, please try the browser, it's cool. Um, and take a t-shirt and stickers and whatnot and pens. Okay, so now I'm done. So now you can clap. Thank you. Okay, so, you, so please, any questions on either topic is good. So how many times is that video buffer copied? Uh, yeah. Actually, going over the memory bus, over backwards. It depends. Okay. It depends on the implementation. Right. Like one of the reasons why I've been looking into it is because I think we have at least one copy too many uh, in Vivaldi in certain scenarios, probably two, which I don't appreciate. So that is one of the reasons why I've been looking at this to try to minimize the copies. Now, the good thing about you know this is playing a video file. Right, so so the latency is not a huge deal, uh, but uh, if you have something called, uh, like real time video, then this the, the copies will cost, and uh, so yeah, so that's definitely something that I want to work on. How crazy are you thinking about going like actually telling the render process how to tile the textures and then send it directly to the GPU, or are you somewhere? What I, what I would like, like, it depends, uh, if, you, if you have uh, the decoded uh, frame, in, it depends on how the decoder works on the platform and blah, blah, blah. But let's say that you have the decoded frame in memory, in the GPU process already, which you do in some scenarios. There is no reason to send it over. So then you could send a handle uh, over and, and uh, when the handle comes back, then you do the uploading. So. Uh, something like that, maybe? Yeah? Any more questions? Yeah. Yes, hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, you were talking about different IPC channels. Mm -hmm. and, um, what kind of IPC method do you use? Uh, in the projects I have been working on, we use local sockets to communicate between different processes. Do you use some other method, or uh, how do you communicate between? Yeah, um, since 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 it's cross-platform, the the, the 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 concepts are very high level because they generally have a platform-specific implementation, and um, so they're generally like layers of implementation. But uh, yeah, local sockets is uh, uh, used. Uh, anything where you can. Uh, now I have to think because I, I'm just thinking. Do do they file the pass file of the descriptors? I'm not sure. The thing is, very often in the code, you are generally so high level, you have like three layers of abstraction beneath you. So I don't really think about it anymore. Okay. Uh, but yeah, but but the, there are platform specific implementations, and you can do whatever you want on your platform, whatever is most optimal for your platform. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So since you work with the browsers, uh, I see that most of the browsers are kind of forked from the Chromium uh, family. And uh, now there's a lot of stuff happening, uh, uh, since we talked about GPU today, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in the Mozilla side with the Servo and Quantum. So do you have a chance to look on the Mozilla side and do you think 
in the future we'll have browsers coming from Mozilla technologies as well? There are browsers that have been based on, on uh, the Mozilla project, several other browsers outside of Firefox. But there, uh, again, there, there are, if you start looking into the browser space, there are quite a lot of browsers, uh, but they have uh, varying degrees of how many people use them. Um, so, uh, and I think, I think the quantum stuff is really cool. Uh, I think the work they did on Rust is really cool. Um, what, what, you have, what you have, I said to somebody earlier here, is that um, the work that was done in Opera in the early 2000s was really cool. And, uh, and what happened when they kind of downsized that and went over to the Chromium Blink thing is that a lot of Opera people went to other browsers. So today we have ex-Opera people working on all of the major browsers. <laughs> so there's a little bit of Opera everywhere. Um, and, and it is a small community and there's a lot of people who skip from one place to another and you get ideas from one place to another and the, 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 the original Chrome team was filled with Firefox people. <laughs> and, 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 and they brought, you know, what they had learned from Firefox and that is some of the inspiration to the Chromium architecture was this kind of we want to, to do more separation in the processes, we want to sandbox them separately. And, and you get a lot from that. And then again, that framework again has inspired Firefox again in this quantum. So the, the good thing about having several browsers, and I think in that case, I, I, I encourage you to try many different browsers because having several browsers and having browser wars is good for browsers. Like I, I, when I worked in Opera and, and I would go to a party, people do that a lot. When they, I'm in a party and they'll go like, oh yeah, where, where do you work? And I was like, I work for Opera and they make a browser. And I was like, I don't use your browser. <laughs> I don't know why that is like a thing that you need to tell me. It's like, no, sorry, you don't have to use my browser. It's like, we're still cool. <laughs> and the, and, but, but then I was like, yeah, but why should I use your browser? And I'm like, okay, so um, does your browser have tabs? And they're like, yeah. It's like, you're welcome. <laughs> does your browser have speed dial thing when you open a new tab? Of course it does. You're welcome. <laughs> because that's the thing. These browsers, they uh, inspire each other. What you had when IE was all alone was, was the all, all innovation stopped. Browser wars are good for the web. Browser wars are good for the user experience in browsers. We need competition. We need people who are different, not the same. And I, and yeah, no, okay, sorry. This is my personal rant. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I guess we have time for a couple more questions. Right, uh, so you obviously talked a lot about explicit synchronization and building command buffers and uh, having this sort of system built on, uh, like in the Chromium side of things. Uh, so that it can still sit on top of OpenGL. Um, so going a little bit forward, uh, there's Vulkan and maybe uh, less like DirectX 12, right? Uh, where you can do this kind of uh, explicit synchronization natively. Have you thought about exploring using, like just ripping out the OpenGL backend entirely and then maybe basing a future project uh, on a Vulkan backend? I, I know there's been some work on Vulkan already. Um, I don't know when they would like to go that way. I find Vulkan to be super interesting. <laughs> so I, I, I would definitely uh, want to look more into that. Um, but it, it basically, it's, it's a little bit like Emma said earlier. It's like if you're going to have something that is currently functional and you want to replace a central component, then you have to make sure that the you don't have any glitches in the move, right? So, uh, yeah, but I find it very interesting and I, I definitely think you're probably going to go that way. It's much easier to maintain conformity uh, uh, using Vulkan than you have with a very high level API like OpenGL is, in my opinion. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, so everybody, once again, uh, for Patricia. Yes. <laughs>